we welcome you to another edition of Being Well Informed. It's our podcast that we air on trending topics of the day. My name is Claudia Barber. I am your host of this podcast, and we look forward to covering very important topics of interest in the community. Uh, Today, we have as our very special guest uh, on being well-informed, we have Robert Stubblefield. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Doing very well, very well, very well. You are connected with the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition. Tell us more about yourself and the work that you do. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me once again. So for those who don't know me, my name is Robert Stubblefield. I grew up predominantly in Montgomery County, but I did spend part of my childhood in places like Prince George's County, Cincinnati, and Cleveland. I got started as an activist and an organizer when I was 12 around um, issues remaining with education and environment and then expanding to policing, um, reparations, work, housing, and now stopping the desecration of historic African-American cemeteries. And I've been with BACC for the past seven years. Well, um, it looks like a lot has been happening when it comes to the Bethesda African American Cemetery, the Macedonia. Uh, give us the proper name and uh, how it got its name. Okay, sure, absolutely. So, official the official name is the River Road Moses Macedonia African Cemetery. Um, we call it Moses Macedonia African Cemetery for short. Now, how it got its name is because it was located on River Road. And it got connected with, and it got the name Moses because in that part of the cemetery, um, there was an African American benevolent group called White's Tabernacle Number no. Thirty Nine of the Brothers and Sis- of the Ancient Order of the Brothers and Sisters of Moses. So that's how it got the Moses part of its name. How it got the Macedonia part of its name was because by the twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties, it became associated with the Macedonia Baptist Church located on River Road. Matter of fact, if you look up newspapers um, in the 30s, 40s, even the 50s with the last known burials on, in the cemetery, you see that the newspapers are calling it River Road Moses Macedonia. But it's all like associated with Bethesda African American Cemetery Coalition? Yes, it's associated with the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition. So to, th- to provide context on how we got started, we got started back around 2015. At the time, the county was doing was proposing a uh, massive development plan called Thrive 2050, and they broke the plan up based on sectors. One of those plans was known as the West Bard Sector Plan. And the master planner, and I really hate the term master planner, but I got to use that language, was meeting with members of the Macedonia Baptist Church, like Segun, Marsha, and, the, and their deacons. And they were talking about how they're going to build this development. And one of the areas they're going to build in was this parking garage. And they said, well, it's alleged that there's a cemetery here, but we don't really think it exists. But with us was a man named Harvey Matthews who grew up on River Road. And he said, that's not an alleged cemetery. That's an actual cemetery. And I know it's a cemetery because me and my neighbors played in that cemetery because we were not allowed to play in the local parks because the parks were segregated. When he said that, the looks on the faces from people from the planning board, they got scared because they were not expecting not just a survivor of displacement on River Road, mm-hmm. but we were not expecting living history. And so Marsha, who had just been installed as the first lady of Macedonia Baptist Church, then she started asking questions well, where are the bodies? And then they said, well, we don't know where the bodies are. And then we said, well, then we have a crime scene on our hands. And so what we did was that we organized and there were members of the descendant community, people who either grew up on River Road or their, had, or their families were just pushed out of, from River Road. They wound up joining the coalition and started telling about the history of the area, what it was like when it was a thriving working class African-American community. And talked about like, how there were farms and how their men would go and build the bomb shelters in the White House because of the skill in stonemasonry. And then what wound up happening in the, you know, of course, the community got displaced. I like to say it got displaced in, in three waves. One with development of um, with, with WSSC compliance. I want to be very clear. I'm not against clean water. 
I'm not against indoor plumbing. Those things are necessary. But especially in the time when this was going on the, by the late 30s with the Great Depression, and we have black residents of Bethesda paying higher water utility bills than their white counterparts, that was one way of displacement. Another display, uh, method of displacement was putting tax liens on the property. Like, you know, let's say you were a taxpayer, you're paying your taxes, and the, then the county government puts a lien on your house saying, if you don't pay this X amount in this amount of days, then we're going to take your home. And if you got by, were able to survive the tax liens, then you got pushed out via good old fashioned Klan violence. A lot of people don't know that there were active chapters of the Ku Klux Klan in Montgomery County. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, Bethesda, that's where the headquarters were for some of the more prominent members of the Ku Klux Klan. And Harvey Matthews and um, a couple people in River Road, like Clint Copeland and Ronald Cunningham talked about how they had to have blackout nights where they had to turn on all the lights in their houses whenever the Klan would ride through so the Klan wouldn't look through and see, well, who can I pull out the house? Mm -hmm. So that's how that community got displaced and how that cemetery got lost in the displacement was that during urban renewal, or as, or as I like to call urban renewal, is just code for black removal. What they began doing was that when they began building uh, an apartment complex, they began desecrating part of the cemetery by, by paving a parking lot over it. And that happened back in 64. And you would think now in the year of our Lord, 2023, that with all the information that's come out about Moses Macedonia African Cemetery, that there should be talk about how do we return the land, how do we work with the descendant community. Instead, they are continuing not only the desecration, but they're insulting the descent of surviving members of River Road. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That is historic information. Uh, but how do we kind of take a grip of this and make changes or is it too late? Well, how do we get a grip of all this? My thing is, is listen to it, it, it. It's multiple. So one thing first is that we need the community to come and listen to the descendant community. You know, and understand that what BACC is saying and the things that we've been up against and what we've tried to do, especially with dispelling some of the the lies that have been said about BACC, uh, among them is that uh, um, one of the lies that's been going on for the past three, soon to be four years now, is that there's there was no burials on one part of the cemetery, which was known, which was called Parcel Two Four Two, or as um, now, there was historical records that even the county's own historians and a historical consulting firm that the county paid for said, no, no, there were burials there and you need to work with the descendant community to properly identify the borders of the cemetery and what do they want done with the land. And the county to this day has said, we're not going to do that. Instead, what they have done basically is that they've given the developer carte blanche to try to, on, on parcel 242, which is currently being desecrated right now, they have given them carte blanche to build a storage space. Now, if you're in that part of River Road, you will notice there are already three storage units out there. Why do you need a fourth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Why on earth do you need a fourth? And, excuse me, for a county that likes to talk about, oh, we need to create more jobs and we're losing jobs to Northern Virginia and Frederick in Frederick, Maryland, excuse me, that you would think that because we've been saying for the past seven years now, let's build a museum. And with museum and with tourism, not only are you creating jobs, but you're also creating a, 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 a community space. And that would be more beneficial to that area because it's helping enlighten the community about what happened here, as well as being a community center um, and doing so by uniting the community and showing the resiliency. But the county just does, the, but the county and the developers just do not want to do that, because for, for them they just want to. They're all about profit. That's all they mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Well, if if the the first time that we address this topic on being well informed, I know that um, First Lady um, Marsha was with us at that time, and along with another guest, and she gave us video coverage of some of the. Um, fencing around the cemetery area and how the bulldozers were coming in to uh, really uh, just um, build anyway it is the best way I can kind of describe it. Uh, I do remember that there was some litigation 
that yeah. began. So where is that now? Okay, great. Absolutely. So, so, so to provide background on the litigation for those who are just tuning in. So around 2021, the Housing Opportunities Commission um, was going to sell the, their part of the cemetery that they own, which is parcel 175, which is the one that's currently under the parking lot. When we found out our attorneys, you know, filed an injunction um, to, with the circuit court and the circuit court ruled in our favor by saying that HOC did not follow the law, which stated if you're going to sell burial property, not only going to get the court involved, but you got to work with the descendant community. HOC filed an appeal with the Court of Appeals, and we had a trial on October 6th of 2022 in, in Annapolis with the, at the Court of Appeals where the, the judges heard the decisions. And they usually after, hear oral arguments, though. They, they, held, they, held, oral, I mean, they held oral arguments. Okay. I mean, they held oral arguments. And then um, around June 28th, yeah, it was June 28th of this year, the Court of Appeals came back and they overturned the decision from the circuit court. The reasoning for the circuit, why the Court of Appeals overturned the um, circuit court's decision is that in their, in, their, in their opinion, they said that they acknowledged that BACC is the primary descendant community they acknowledge the cemetery and they acknowledge how that land was. And this is their words, how that land was lost due to displacement, which now I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I know you're a corp. I think that's a legal way of saying how that land was stolen. You know? Right. Okay. But, but what the court of appeals was basically saying is that economic development and affordable housing matters more than the respect of a barrel property. And our attorneys basically said that what the court of appeals did was they overturned over 200 years of American jurisprudence that has rights when it comes to protecting burial property. So that's what the Court of Appeals basically did. And um, our attorneys have now filed an appeal to the Maryland Supreme Court, um, basically to overturn the Court of Appeals decision because it, in our attorney's words, like it seemed like the judges on the Court of Appeals were stretching, trying to find any excuse to Go be in favor of um, a, the rule in favor of HOC, the Housing Opportunities mm -hmm. Committee. I see. Well, at the um, middle appellate level, there's all. It's always, oftentimes, three judge panels that decide cases, and sometimes it matters who the three judges are. And uh, you know, who knows if you have people that are residents of Bethesda that are on the panel. Um, then you also have the issue of. Uh, uh, the you know you got to follow a petition for writ or mm -hmm. or or get the case to the Supreme Court of Maryland. Yeah, and uh, so you're saying that it's still in the works. Yes, yes, litigation is still in the works because, uh, and to provide some background, which to me is very egregious, is the fact that at the circuit court level, HOC's basis for not contacting BACC was that. BACC and Macedonia Baptist Church didn't have a connection to Moses Cemetery, that they uh, weren't sure where the cemetery was, even though we have them on video in meetings where they are acknowledging that the cemetery is there under the parking lot. So the fact that they committed perjury at the circuit court and then when they appealed at the at the court of appeals, which is like the mid, which is, as you as you already say, is the mid level. Any judge who would have saw who was watching that should have dismissed HOC's appeal because basically HOC perjured themselves. And in my opinion, a judge would have been like, you guys perjured yourself to my colleague at the lower level. How do I trust you telling me the truth now? I'm not going to hear your case. But instead, the Court of Appeals allowed it because HOC changed her argument over like the wording of the law. Because it's because uh, the because the law says, oh, the court may versus the court shall. Now, me personally, now I know that like some people think, well, that's that's the law. However, as our attorneys had pointed out, and other cases involving um, burial property point out, the court like, there are time there are plenty of times regarding burial properties where the may does where the word court may does mean the court shall because you are dealing with the selling of burial property and you have there are certain protocols and procedures that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. So that's so, and the the court of appeals these were. Relatively three conservative. I'm going to, these relatively three older conservative white men. Um, they were more concerned. They're calling it the property instead of calling it a a cemetery, and um, that right there to me 
was in indig- even though despite the fact that our attorney was very in my opinion very brilliant and HOC's attorney was for lack of a better word stumbling over themselves it was like the judges were still giving HOC like all these other chances and so I, I see what you're saying yes no I understand I've been I've practiced before the Maryland uh, well it used to be the court of special appeals and and uh, now it has a new name and I, I get the 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 you know the assignment of judges the three judge panel uh, what uh, you know what power they have etc and sometimes you really feel like you know justice is not being served you just you're just shaking your head and and saying you know how could this be and um, uh, cause see they would you know I doubt very seriously if they would make that same remark and say that affordable housing takes precedent over uh, some other cemetery that's not a slave cemetery. They would never do that. I mean, it's just outrageous. Uh, so to the point that this has happened, first of all, I also have to give uh, a lot of com- commendation to the attorneys who took on this major, major effort uh, because it's, it's, it's no small task when you think of all the levels that it's gone through thus far. Yes, our attorneys um, at uh, Rothwell and Fig um, with Mr. Lieberman, the fact that they're doing this um, case pro bono for us is very amazing on on itself. And the fact that they're taking on, taking on with a passion um, Mm -hmm. to me is very phenomenal. Because I remember Mr. Lieberman um, going back to the circuit court, he talked about how, in, you know, um, in his faith, Judaism, that the desecration, how like the desecration of Jewish cemeteries during World War II, and even what's going on in some parts of Europe, effect is, is very is effective because, um, the you know because we know what desecration means. You know, right. desecration basically means it's a hate crime, and it's considered like one of the signs of genocide. And so, like, the desecration of African-American cemeteries is very similar to the desecration of Jewish cemeteries and the fact that it is a hate crime, it is genocide, and it is considered, per international law, an act of war mm-hmm. when you're desecrating, desecrating a, a cemetery. Right. And so the fact that our attorneys have undertaken this has been very phenomenal, and we're very thankful to our attorneys, um, especially with the fact that they filed the appeal to the court of, that they filed the appeal to the Maryland Supreme Court, and that um, they're they're taking us on doing all the research, just saying, showing why this case needs to be heard in the Maryland Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. So I'm very, very appreciative of that, and it does also ties into the fact that BACC. I like to say that BACC is part of a community grounded liberation movement in the sense that we are here not trying to educate people, but to but to demand justice. Um, because the thing is, even though the uh, the arc. Bends, uh, the universe bends towards justice. It is the people that make the that, that bend that arc even further and faster. It, so that's yeah. what you see doing it. So this this coalition really is significant in the work yes. that it's done. Yes, yes. The, we are a, a coalition that we have faith based leaders from Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism. We have um, young and old. It's more intergenerational. It's a multiracial coalition. We also have a, a new partnership with Ben and Jerry's. Uh, matter of fact, um, the Ben and Jerry's Foundation just gave us a grant, which helps uh, um, with our, it's a two year grant to help fund our work for two years, mm-hmm. which will help us with um, education programs, um, helping up with flyers and rallies. We even have a partnership not only with Washington Episcopal Schools, but also with the Montgomery County Public School System. And we now have partnerships with American University, Bowie State University, Howard University to really help educate, to really help bring this in, uh, into college classrooms. And we are, I feel that we even have, we have, we have a lot more um, coming down the, um, coming down the pipeline in terms of things that we want to be able to do. But the, our main focus is demanding a return of that, a return of land back to the Senate community so we can do what we've been saying, that is have a museum and a sacred space to truly honor those who helped build Bethesda. Right, right. And, uh, you know, the, I admire the work that you, the coalition, is doing. And um, Dr. Coleman, I know that um, 
it's it's uh, it's huge. I, I, it's just a huge undertaking. Now, there were some people that saw in a recent 60 Minutes broadcast in July 2023, there was a segment on how slave cemeteries are being desecrated across the country. Yes. So how is this happening? So it's happening in, in, I know I'm going to try my best to break this down in, in five minutes because, the, the, because this is a, a, a topic that requires another show. But what's going on across the country is that, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of historically African-American cemeteries are being desecrated. Part of the reason why they're being desecrated is because of the fact that a lot of these cemeteries, they're either are on the records or they weren't or they were intentionally left out of the of these inventories of cemeteries like if you go to some to um in florida because they're covering like a cemetery where a shopping center has been built over about five miles away there's a cemetery that is dedicated to confederate veterans and instead of that uh cemetery being desecrated when they're trying to build a roadway they turned it into a roundabout where basically you drive around the bodies, but you don't have to drive through them. But meanwhile, there, there's a historic, the historic black cemetery in that 60 minutes. And there's a, there's a shopping center and a roadway built over it. That's part of the reason. The other part of the reason why what happens, why like this is happening to historic black cemeteries is that in many cases, not all, but many, that a lot of the black communities that lived around the cemeteries have been pushed out due to displacement, some call it gentrification, or as I call it, domestic imperialism, where you're pushing out these communities that have turned land that, you know, you know that, that turned this land into beautiful farmland or built businesses, and you're pushing them out instead of welcoming them into the community, you're pushing them out to make way for development. And then the other thing too, and this is something that it goes it boils back down to the fundamental question that was asked during the the Dred Scott decision of 1857: mm -hmm. Do black are black people human? Does it, it really goes down to that? You know, case in point. I'll go case in point. In, in Des Moines, Iowa, there's a historically predominantly white cemetery that, despite all this development, it's fenced off. Like you can't, they will not allow you to build or develop anywhere on that cemetery or, or a few places adjacent to it. That area is fenced off because they said we're going to protect it. But black cemetery goes back to black cemeteries, and I would even want to say even to indigenous burial grounds. It goes back to the question: Are we human? Are we considered human? And if they're willing to, to desecrate our burial sites, then they're going to get away with or justify with, with killing us with police witnesses of police brutality. Because if we don't matter in death, then our surely our lives do not. And in the eyes of the overculture, our lives don't matter when we're alive, unfortunately. So that's how like this is happening. Do we need more proactive legislators? I would say yes. Um, I, I would say there needs to be proactive legislators from the standpoint of the fact that you cannot be scared because you ask yourself this question, how would you feel if you had parents or family buried in this one cemetery and then all of a sudden this developer says, you know what, I want to build a shopping center here or I want to build a hotel here or I want to build name whatever. And they want to okay. build. Yeah, just like and just like that, they want to build you and, and you can't visit your family anymore. You would feel some type of way. So put yourself in the shoes of the Senate community. Um, in terms of, you know, who've been fighting for these fronts for X amount of years. I mean, yes, BACC have been fighting it for it for eight years, but I would say there are other communities across the country that have been fighting just as long or even longer. And they've been demanding, but legislators all like to twiddle their thumbs, you know, when it comes to when it comes to black issues. And I have a particular bone to pick when, with black politicians who see black cemeteries being desecrated and either they twiddle their thumbs and or they take money from developers that are desecrating it. Mm. There, in my, in my opinion, there is a, and I'm not, I'm not trying, uh, I'm trying my best not to, you no, know, no, it's in the Bible. There is a special place in hell, I feel, for black politicians who sit by and lack black cemeteries be desecrated because there's a saying, those who reject their ancestors will be rejected by their offspring. And so, that being said, I feel that in order to have more proactive and um, proactive and progressive legislators, there must be a liberation movement that is in power at every level. 
Now, what do I mean by a liberation movement being empowered? It means the fact, it means uh, and regarding um, protecting historic black cemeteries, it means the thought of building on top of a black cemetery isn't even thought of. And anyone who even thinks of that gets punished to the highest extent of the law, both criminally and civilly. And there's legislation that not only is designed to protect those cemeteries, but to preserve and restore them if they've been neglected and return them to the descendant communities, um, you know, to the descendant communities. That's why I believe in proactive legislator, but they have to come from liberation movements, you know, for that to happen. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the um, the other question is how can the audience join the coalition and what is there left to do? Okay, great. So, yes, uh, we, we need people. You know, my, my thing is always is, we, you know, if then there's many things people can do. Everyone, we believe everybody can help serve in some capacity. If you're able to help join us at rallies, join us. If marching ain't your, isn't your thing, but you like writing, we have a newsletter called The Bulletin, where, you know, the bulletin where you can write some articles. Or if you just want to donate money, that's totally fine. But you can get involved. Um, you can join our website, which is um, Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition .net. There you can keep up with us in terms of what we got going down the pipeline. Um, you can also follow us on social media. Um, our Twitter and Instagram are the same. It's at Beth, which is B-E-T-H-A-F-R Cemetery. That information is also on our website where to follow us on social media. Um, you can follow us. You guys, you can follow us on social media, look on our website. Um, other things that you can do to help support us is like you can help retweet or like um, retweet or share our posts on your social media. You can tell your friends about what's going on in Bethesda, if you, especially if you live in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. The other thing that we have going on right now, this is something that uh, I'm, I, we announced it on Juneteenth, but I just want to reiterate that BACC has now announced and debuted a reparation study and action plan for Montgomery County, and we need to get as much widespread support on that because, quite frankly, is and um, not um, the returning of black land and black cemeteries is part of the reparations discussion. And so if people you know, people who definitely believe in justice and truly believe in racial equity, they would definitely be very helpful to help not only support the um, BACC, but also the reparations plan that we have designed and developed with other descendant communities in Montgomery County. Mm. Wow. So you've given us a wealth of information, and I'm proud to say that uh, we have been on the, the inside uh, track of uh, the developments that are happening with the Bethesda African American Coalition. And I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of everything that you all are doing to preserve legacy. And uh, it's, it's important. You just don't trash it. You just don't build over it unless you don't care. I mean, that's to, that to me, it's just, it's just that simple. So, you know, I thank you again for um, being a part of our program uh, today because uh, it was so enlightening to um, uh, share with us. We appreciate your participation and you must again come back again because we uh, were very, very uh, blessed to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I look forward to being back again. Thank you.